Chinhui, and today at PyCon APEC, I will be talking about how do we design data functional data pipelines for reproducibility and maintainability. A little bit myself, my name is Chinhui, I work as a data engineer at DT1, a fintech company that provides access to digital communications for over 5 billion people across emerging economies. Before before getting into data engineering, I have a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And after my day job, I am a speaker and occasional writer on data processing. And if you'd like to check out the slides, um, here's the link. So when we, when we talk about designing data pipelines, we need to consider the basic data pattern, which is the data pipeline. So in this case, we have an input, the square, we have the operator, the, which is having the shape and a circle that fits the shape. And we have the output in this case. So it looks pretty straightforward. Right? We have an input, we have an operation, we have an operation and we have an output. But when we could design a data pipeline scale, it gets a little bit more tricky. Because we need to consider the following factors. Firstly, we need to consider reliability. Then the data pipeline has to be scaled, reliable. So the data pipeline must produce the desired output, which links us to the topic of reproducibility. Secondly, the data pipeline has to be scalable, which means that the data pipeline must run independently across multiple nodes, which leads us to the concept of parallelism. And as we, uh, as we, as the, and as we design the data pipeline for scale, we also need to consider that we need to add more add more features with changing business logic, so we need to be able to extend the existing data pipeline with that, which leads us to the concept of maintainability. So, we, so there are some challenges that we face in designing data pipelines at scale, such as uh, prob the issue of reproducibility during testing. So for example, we have a scenario whereby we have all collection of local requests and we like to determine whether the, whether the customer is trustworthy based on the customer credit ratings and the data source. And, our, and so in this case, the combination logic is uh, whether the customer is trustworthy. And the, and, the, and, the, and the input is the data source. And then once we and then we collect the results and the output is is uh, on the target, which is the approved loans. And when we can, when we consider this scenario, and because and when we like consider like how when we are testing it, the main dependencies that we have are your data source and your computation logic. And for, and for compliance purposes, when we run the same pipeline today, we need to be very sure that with the same data source and the same data composition logic, co and, like three, and we compare to compute it at different times, let's say three months later, we need to be sure, we need to be sure, we need to ensure that we produce the same output. And this depends on the data source as well as the composition logic which we will need to consider during testing. So the challenge is that they've given the same data source, how do we ensure that we replicate the same results every time we rerun the same process? And once, we, okay, so once we design the data pipeline, it passes tests, and so it's time to go to production. And when we are going to production, we need to consider that we like to scale across multiple nodes because we have so many transactions and we we need to be able to scale. And this and that's why we need to parallelize across multiple nodes. And in the same in the case of um, sales transaction whereby we are computing margins and to us we like to determine like how much margin we are making for each transaction. Because the comp the first the cost the computation logic of computing margin is dependent is only dependent on the sales transaction itself on a role base on a role based basis. So in this scenario we can simply chunk the sales transaction into multiple chunk. We feed them from multiple nodes which is computing the same computation logic. We collect all those sets or the sets from each of the nodes into a, and then we have a data set called the transaction margin. 
so with this scenario whereby the process is independent of each other, um, it's actually pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. But what if we we have some dependencies and some and that is dependent on the state of the data source? So this is so this is so if we have this scenario of a transaction request whereby we will need to determine whether there are enough balance in the inventory so that we can approve the transaction. And if we have a case of we have multiple nodes and then each multiple nodes they like they, they, they will have they will process they will actually process this transaction request at different times. So which means that the order in which the the request is made matters because once so let's say because the inventory the inventory balance that I expect in that I, I, I'm actually expecting is going to be dependent on the time in which I make the I actually make the request to to call the inventory balance. And this brings us into the, the issue of, you know, when the, of course my inventory balance is going to change over time, it is actually immutable, and that means that in, uh, it means that in production, production, I will have to keep track of the state of the inventory balance. And it, and, th and if this state is dependent on the time, and it's dependent on which transaction is being performed first among those multiple clusters, then what is the current state of the data source? Because we have a scenario of a shared state, and the challenge that, that is that is in debugging parallel concurrent code and that runtime due to those shared states. And so this brings us to the challenge of how do we design data pipelines that run the same competition logic across multiple nodes and reproduce predictable results every time. Now we have handled reproducibility, we have developed a data pipeline, so we need to consider the maintainability during debugging. Because when we develop a data pipeline, it might work in testing, but it breaks in production. So this actually happens more often than we, we wish, and this is mainly because of age cases and inefficiencies that are not detected in test cases, causing performance issues and off in production. Because while, because while we put in our best effort to write our test cases to reflect what uh, like possible scenarios that they may expect in production, but it's there are certain cases in production that may not that we may not be aware of and it actually services in production. And when the test case are actually a subset of whatever we have in production, we have, have, we have a smaller data set and in and, and performance issues tend not to show up that or that that evidence D and test, but those but then it actually starts showing up with long run times in production. And to complicate the debugging in the in when designing data pipelines and skill is that there are certain complexities in debugging and logging for parallelism. Let's say in the pace so let's see, whether is it in a Spark cluster or whether it, that is it running uh, multi processing what multi processing? Trying to debug and log parallel code is such that we will need to it this there isn't really a very ideal solution for that. Because you need to be able to, you need to be, you need to know which, which, which node is the process failing and so on and so forth. And it can get a bit messy with the current solutions we have. So the challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that are reasonable and maintainable as its core to reduce inefficiencies in production debugging at scale? Because it can be a pretty time consuming trying to debug on a parallel cluster. So instead of doing that, why not we design our data pipeline such that once we once we can understand the code, we read the code and then we will be able to figure out how to debug our data pipeline based on our the edge cases and efficiencies that surface. And we also need to consider the maintainability of a data pipeline when we're adding new features because as the business is growing, um, business needs actually business needs to evolve, and with that uh, we do need to add new features 
to uh, to uh, continually evolve and growing code base. And with this increasing code complexity, the code reasoning does become more challenging. And with multiple developers working on the same code base, and with that, this, and maybe we have a new developer coming in, and we have to, and we add more, more dependencies and. And when we add new features, there is always a risk of uh, introducing unintended behavior due to certain dependencies that we introduced. So the challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that adapts well to changing business and technical requirements and also ensures developer productivity. And so, this, so with all these challenges, this brings us to the concept of using data pipeline, of viewing data pipelines as functions which leads us to functional programming. So what is functional programming? Uh, this is a declarative style programming that emphasizes writing software using only pure functions and immutable values. The, key, the three key principles of functional programming are we need, uh, that we need to have, we need, you are using pure functions and we avoid side effects, uh, concept of immutability, and as well as the concept of referential transparency. So when we talk about pure function, uh, it's, it's a pure function is a function that where the output depends on firstly input, secondly internal algorithm, and pretty much nothing else. And remember that this pure function must not have any side effects. So it should only be an input, and then you have a pure function, and then it produces an output. And a pure function is such that the output depends only on its input parameters and its internal algorithm. There shouldn't be any like external external effects, there shouldn't be any side effects, and the consequence is that the consequence of that is that if we have the same function and the same input parameter, we should be expecting the same result regardless of the number of invocations. It's to illustrate the concept of pure function, um, we, uh, let's use the analogy of making pizza. So let's say I have a dough, I have uh, ingredients, I have a tomato, cheese, uh, yeah, including the pineapple, we put them together. So we have one, so then we check and then put them together in the collection and the collection of ingredients. We put them into the oven with uh, 100, well, at 160 degrees when so we give for 10 minutes and then we expect pizza. And so in this case, oh, this is the ideal scenario of making pizza. But in the real world, uh, making pizza is an impure function because it causes side effects. Because in the process of making pizza, we may produce radiation heat from the oven, which affects the environment outside the oven. Or it, when we keep reusing the oven, the oven may overheat, so instead of running at 160 degrees Celsius, it's actually baking the pizza at 180 degrees Celsius. And because of that, we end up with a burnt pizza, and that is also a side effect of the pure of the impure function. So to summarize, so to summarize, a, a function with side effects changes state outside the local function scope. Um, in this case, so based on the analogy, the local function scope is the oven. So some examples would be modifying a variable or data structure in place, modifying global state, performing any I/O operation, uh, and it could also be true exception with an error because it is effectively true exception outside the local function scope. Secondly, we go to the we go on to the concept of immutability, which which states that once a variable is being is being assigned a value. It cannot be reassigned again. It cannot be modified or altered because if it because it will cause an assignment error. So once a, so the immutability of assigned variable is such that once a once it is assigned to a value is assigned to a variable, the state of the variable cannot be changed. And the and the implication of that is that it enforces a certain level of discipline state management. Because once I instantly the variable, I know that it's not gonna I know that I cannot change the variable and that is going to and then I will need to manage the state manually in my head and with that it also prevents side effect which is called resulting from state changes, which links to the concept of a pure function not having side effects. 
The key implication of the concept of, of immutability is the ease of writing parallel concurrent programs. Thus, once we know that the input the input the input data and the input variable is immutable, then we don't really need to care about what is the what is the state anymore because we know that the state of the input will not change, and this allows us to that this allows us to. Like this, to write our parallel programs in the following pattern. So we have a, a, a immutable variable as an input of so, and then we ha and then we have a set of transactions, and then we copy the margins, the parallel clusters, and then we collect all those results in sets, and then with all those sets of from the results, we collect them into a new collection of results for transactions with margins. Last but not least, uh, when we talk about ref when we talk about function of piece function programming, we also need to talk about referential transparency. Yeah, for referential transparency, such that uh, when I have an expression and I have, I can re replace the expression with its equivalent algorithm. In this case, and I did not change and the and the Keyword is that I can substitute the expression by its equivalent algorithm without affecting the program logic for all programs. So some conditions for referential transparency is that besides being a pure function, it also has to be deterministic, which means that the expression always returns the same output given the same input. So let's illustrate the let's illustrate the bit of determinism of this was deterministic versus non-deterministic. So for a deterministic, a deterministic function, at all times, um, if let's say if I bake a, if I want to make toast, I put bread in the oven, I should be expecting toast. So I should be expecting that at all times. However, if at certain time I get toast, but then at another time I get burnt toast, then it means that the oven bake the uh, the toast making process in the oven, it's Non, it actually depends on time, and hence it is non-deterministic. Last but not least, uh, the to meet the conditions for referential transparency, it, it also, the, it, the function also has to be idempotent, which means that the expression can be applied multiple times without changing the result of your in, initial application. And so this illustration, um, it illustrates illustrates the concept of its importance and let's use an example of the absolute value so we know that if we put a negative value in the absolute function we are going to get a positive value if we put that into another absolute function we are still going to get a positive value and it's going to keep it and it's going to be the same no matter how many times you, in, you, in, you use the absolute function beyond its first invocation A key consequence of referential transparency is that of equational reasoning, because in that case the expression itself can be replaced with its equivalent result. So in this case, we have a square. We have a square function with uh, which has a certain result, and it, we can actually replace that square function with its result itself. Now we talked about the key principles of functional programming, let's go on to functional control flows. And how do we write control okay, so why how we write functional control flows in functional programming is through the use of functional composition, whereby we apply a function f and a function a function g, so that's actually equivalent to a composite function g dot f. And the fun and function and function composition is uh, is and is an important concept in functional programming because that's how we actually write program. But besides that, we also need to we also need to have a have a, have a scenario whereby you know functions are values and in Python functions are first class objects. And what does it mean by that? Is that a function can be assigned to a variable, pass as a parameter to other functions, and return as a value from other functions. 
So functions are values are a key is a is a key concept of functional programming. And the key consequence of uh, first class functions is that we can write function composition using higher order functions. The higher order function has any sort of these properties. It either accepts functions as a parameter or it accepts for far a function as a value or it could be both. Related to the concept of, of concept of is of functional programming and functional composition is that of anonymous functions also known as the lambda expression python and so typically when we instantiate a function we will, we will define a name function and then it becomes a name function object and for, sim for simple expressions uh, we do not need to we do we prefer not to name we do not need to name the function object and we can use it in our operation as input. When we talk about about higher order functions. Let's talk about the three most commonly used higher order functions in functional programming. For with the map function, whereby we map those small spaces to the shapes. We have the filter operation, whereby we filter. Whereby for example, we filter a. a filter objects that fulfills a certain predicate which typically involves a true false. We also have reduce operation whereby we have our inputs and then we compose them into a single input as an out a single output. And if we compare the use of that for the reduce versus for loops, what we notice is that in a for loop, we are managing state change of reusable variables. But in the case of a map filter reduce operation, there is no, we don't have to manage those state changes because of, because, and it's pretty straightforward. Once we talk about functional composition, we just need to talk about a little bit about recursion as a form of functional iteration. Because recursion is a form of self-referential functional composition and then it takes the results of the cell as inputs into another instance of the cell. And because we can't keep having this going on forever, so we need to have a base case required as a terminating condition for the recursion. So this is best illustrated in this word that following exactly illustration. We have the recursive tall stack whereby once we call a function and then it has the call stack all the way until the base case. And then when it reaches the base case, base case it starts descending the recursive call stack and popping it, popping them one by one. In contrast for an iterative loop, while we do need to manage the state changes, we are not taking as much memory compared to a recursive call stack. And to overcome this challenge, we, in functional programming, we use what we call tail call optimization, which is to reduce the stack of consumption in the call stack. So what, is, so, the so what we're looking at is the tail call, which does nothing other than returning the value of the function call. And how, how we do a tail call optimization is that we identify the tail calls and we compile them to iterative loops. And this is the case for Scala. This might not be the and other function. This might not be the case of our Python, but this is more of a best practice for functional programming. And so this is this illustration shows a bit about tail call optimization, whereby we are, we are looking for a tail call pattern in the tail call stack in in the recursion stack. So in this case, we have a factorial factorial as a tail call. And, and with all the tail calls that stacks up, uh, we can compile them as an iterative loop in the compiler. Now that we talked about the key, about why do we about the functional programming, how to write, how to use you write functional control flows, let's talk about functional data patterns for the department design. And so we have uh, list comprehensions, which is effectively synthetic sugar format filter. 
in a data collection. And we can use map filter in data transformation such, uh, such that we filter the output the filter and we filter whatever we don't need and then we map to and then we map using the operation. So the benefits of using that filter in data transformation is that we keep the data and trans transformation logic separate and this improves the code reusability with better transparency of transformation logic. And we can extend that filter to parallel concurrent programming during the use of a multiprocessing module. So in this scenario, we can see that we create an iter we create iterator using map, and then we and then after we get our result, we do a filtering to a collection, or in this case, a list. So, in, so, we, so in the example that I showed earlier, we use multiprocessing in the pool, but we can also use concurrent futures. And if you would like to find out a bit more about that, you can check out my EuroPython 2020 talk on speed up your data processing. Second functional de de design pattern of toolbox that we can use is the immutable data structures. Because once a immutable data structure is created, it cannot be changed. The benefits of this is that it's easier to reason because what you see is what you get. It's easier to test because you worry about the logic, not so much about the state. And last but not least, it is track safe because whatever that or whatever that we have is immutable, we can't change it. And because of that, it's easier for parallelism. Now, let's take for example of a list. So, in a, because a list is a mutable, mutable variable, I can alter elements as a list. But not so much for a tuple, where if we try to perform the same operation, we end up with an assignment error. Another example is when we try to create a class, let's say a class that with certain attributes. And a similar data structure will be that of a dictionary whereby it has a key and it has its value. And so those are those are immutable data structures. So if you would like to make sure that if you would like to use immutable data structures, we could consider using the name tuple and by we once we instantiate a certain object that is of a certain class and we try to change the attribute, we cannot change the attribute once it has been instantiated. Well, that's not exactly the full picture. If we use a underscore replace, we do see that it, it does appear that there might be some attribute change, but instead it is creating a new point instance while the original point instance was not altered. We could talk so we, we another design pattern that we're going to talk about is structural pattern matching and uh, it's a Python triple ten feature that's inspired by similar syntax scala and is especially useful for conditional matching of data structure patterns. So we can see that it's a match case scenario uh, at some scenarios. What's the difference between if and if else and match case? So if we look at the right, uh, as of the right, whereby we need to check whether the relevant the, var the variable is of a certain type. But with match case expressions, we do not need to explicitly write the in instance. Instead, we could match based on the properties of the input. So let, let's and like how it's being how is the data structure like. But in this case, we would like to identify whether something is a float or not, we could actually use structural pattern matching for this scenario. And this brings me to the topic of pattern matching for maintainability of data schemas. So this is actually inspired by data like case classes and pattern matching syntax in Scala, so uh, then so do keep that in mind. I've tested the code. Yeah, so in Python, while clear classes are used as the Python equivalent of scalar case classes, and in this case, I have made the data class an immutable variable. 
Unfortunately, in Python, telco optimization is not supported. Then the op op optimization has to be implemented manually. And on, on top of this limitation of this challenge, we also have the recursion limit of 1000 by default as a primitive best mechanism. Okay, it's called the overflow in the C Python implementation. Because what happens is that as we have the call stack file count, we end up with a C segmentation for the error. And we end up with stack overflow situation which we do not wish to for it to happen. In and for functional programming, we do use type systems. Um, while Python does not enforce type systems at runtime, it does have support for type chains, as can be seen in the full example. In addition, we can also enforce type uh, uh, typing by using type checking with MyPy. So in this scenario, if you key in a string for uh, so what's supposed to be a float input, then I will end up with a type error because I can't. So because that is effectively in like not the type that we would like to have. And with the use of my part, it helps prevent boxes type runtime by ensuring type safety and consistency across the data pipeline. So after all this discussion, um, can we write a purely functional data pipeline in Python? Mm, turns out, not really, because we still need to consider that there are I.O. operations that are, that are for write, reading and writing data outside of the application domain. So to resolve that, we, need to, we can consider using the Design pattern of functional core imperative shell, which is a reference on Gary and Gary Bellhart's PyCon 2030 talk of boundaries. So this idea of a functional core imperative shell is that we keep the core domain logic and the infrastructure code separate. So the infrastructure code can actually feed the data and then and get and then we write to get when we write data. But the core competition logic still remains core. And this is an example of how we can use the functional core imperative shell design pattern to design our pipeline. So we can have an IO layer to read the data in the program, we have a functional layer for the competition logic, and then finally we have an IO layer to write the data outside of the program. So the key takeaways from this talk is that to ensure, to ensure that our data pipelines are designed for reproducibility and utilability, we, need, we, will need, we can consider adopting functional design patterns, such as for such as the, the consideration of reproducibility, scalability, and maintainability across parallel and distributed workflows. And on top of you adopting functional design, design patterns, we could also adopt the design pattern of functional core and predictive shell to manage the side effects separately from the data pipeline logic. So, thank you so much for, for watching my talk. You can reach out to me via the following socials, and you could also check out my ongoing series of functional programming at the following link. Thank you. Hi guys, we are with Tim now, Tim is a data engineer with a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. As a 90% self-taught programmer, she is learning scholar for uh, functional programming and she wish making data pipeline run faster and she eat data for breakfast, you know. <laughs> uh, and Jean, thank you for joining me today on live Q&A. Okay. Okay. On the top, uh, so your talk is designing functional data pipeline for reproduce and maintainability, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, by the way, I love your example about pizza in the talk. It's very clear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So so, okay. Can uh, we will start uh, with the first question? Uh, why you why do you interested in functional programming in the first place? I think like functional programming, right? it's really about using functions 
to design a program. And when we're looking at like data engineering, uh, or if we look at data pipelines in general, what we really have is, you know, we have an input, we do something, we do some processing so that we get a desired output. And that, and it's sort of similar to when we have a function. What we do is that we put something into the function. The function does something and returns an output. So, so well, if we want to look at, you know, function, like functional programming as a paradigm, maybe we could also look at other paradigms such as imperative programming or like more imperative programming. So let's say, well, let's say when we start learning our first language and then we do like when we do instructions, just like, you know, a recipe. And we then what we do is, okay, I do this, then I do this, then I do this and I do this, like in a, like something like a procedural manner. However, when we are looking at like, like data pipelines at scale, which basically does one thing, takes an input, does something, and then get an output. Then this sort of this sort of pattern that we see, right? Which we, I call it data pipeline design pattern. <clears throat> very similar to how we do a function. And and that's actually part of that's actually part of the reason why I am interested in the functional programming paradigm. But that's not the only reason. Because this is a, so this is actually goes back to like, like having to process a lot of data and then we have to go into parallel programming and when we're going to parallel programming we have this sort of pattern such that like, such that we have an input we want to do something and we want to do that something across multiple computes multiple nodes and for that there is this for that imperative programming does have that limitation in that if I use imperative programming, I will also need to manage the state of the variable at a point in time. And, if I, and that is not something that is very scalable. If I want to go to beyond one core, I want to go to four cores, multiple cores. And for that, for such, if I want to design it for scale such that I can run the same function across multiple computes, then I will need to have a paradigm that allows me to represent it in a way whereby I can duplicate it across multiple nodes and I don't need to worry about what is the state of a particular variable at a particular time. I want to have that sort of, you know, I want to have the reassurance that I can run the same thing and I'm going to get the same output every time I run it. And that is, and this sort of, this sort, this sort of need in, in designing data pipeline as skill is what led me to be interested in using functional programming paradigm to into our design our, our design of data pipelines. And I think the additional benefit is that you know, if I view it in terms of input, some doing something and output, then it's a bit more it's a bit more natural to express when you're designing data pipelines. Well, that's very great example. So, so uh, can you give me a real more example? Yeah, functional. Yeah, I was going to, yeah, if I may ask a question, because functional programming usually is associated with other languages, like Julia or Lisp or stuff like that. So, why did you end up with Python? Well, actually, actually, Python is not my first programming language. It was my first programming language because I actually started out with C. Delve a little bit into MATLAB, that the did a little bit of C++, and then go into Python. And this year, I'm actually learning Scala for functional programming. And so I so with this experience with multiple programming languages, multiple programming paradigms, be it imperative, be it like procedural, a bit of object oriented programming and now for functional programming. And then I see that, you know, there are, like, there are use cases in which you can use certain paradigms. And in the case of functional programming, it just happened to tie very well with like data, like with data engineering, whereby uh, well, the fundamental design pattern that we are looking at is the data pipeline. And this design pattern 
happens to come like come in very like fit in very well with the functional programming paradigm. And that also and, and it also addresses a challenge that I face when I am designing data pipelines in Python, whereby I try to define something. And then I mean like you know data data science teams we have a habit and then we keep reusing the same variable here and there, which is a really very good practice actually. If you are doing designing at scale, I mean it has its own use cases, but it's not very good if you are trying to design a data pipeline whereby you know data types and consistencies is quite important. And then, but and from there, and that is and that's one inspiration. Another inspiration is you know when I'm trying to design, I'm trying to process data that is doesn't really fit into memory. I need to chunk. I need to do parallel processing. And then I need to use you know, like map, filter, that sort of thing to be able to deal with those iterators and stuff like that. And 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 that and that actually led me to my my talk on parallel processing last year to really address this problem. But as I delve in further, I kind of realized that you know, if we want to be able to do parallel programming well, we there is this still this problem of you know state management. And this style of statement and that and this style of state management is something that functional programming does address. And and that's actually what and, and that's actually one of the reasons why I decided, you know, I want to delve a bit more into functional programming. And that was my the inspiration. That, and that led me to joining a new company which uses Scala so that I can learn functional programming in in a language that is that actually designs functional programming as its base, as its primary paradigm, and from there I actually learned quite a bit, and I thought that that there could be some like useful design patterns, yeah, and then principles that could be brought to Python also. Oh, that's great answer. Okay, so the next question would be, how do we design data pipeline that adapt well to changing business and uh, technical requirement. Can you tell us more about that, Tim? About designing data pipelines that can adapt to business requirements, and then yeah. number I think if you for that right, we need to consider how we actually work as a development team. So in development teams, people come and go, and so people who are so people who are working on the code base may be new to the code base. And so if you are and so I mean businesses they will evolve, they will grow, and sometimes they may have changing needs because of management. And so it's important that whatever code base that we have is already designed such that I don't need to make some breaking changes into, you know, like a whole bunch of like, you know, monolith. And then when you mess up with when you tweak something and then it ends up trigger it ends up like that particular something has a whole lot of dependencies and you break something. And the thing is that like if we if the if a code is like a monolith and then you tweak something and you run the risk of actually breaking everything else, then that's not extensible. And so how and so how do we actually design it to be extensible is such that no, we like we try to design our data pipeline such that I have like let's say if I have I want to do some if I want to do like I want to compute a certain like revenue metric, then I use this function. Then I use this function. I have I need to have expected input, I do something, I have expected <coughs> output. And then so in a way we need to have, you know, like a base, like, you know, a base case whereby I am actually like, I wish let, let's say I'm actually cover, like, I, let's say I wish I like, I mean, the base case for data pipelines is that I take an input and do something and then I get an output, right? So maybe we have the base case and then we start add, and then we add scenarios whereby we need to whereby that something may not be computing revenue. It may be something different. And we have to so we design so we have, you know, a base case which deals with your input output, that sort of, you know, and sort of like stuff with a bit of side effects. And then for those site functionals 
components, which are mainly about the business logic, then we actually design them as functions. And that's one way, then that's actually a design pattern, which we can adopt to design accessible data pipelines. And this links to one the, the what the main point that I actually mentioned in my in, at the end of my talk is that you know functional logic we use functional programming. Everything else is regarding the input and output. That base case, we still need to you know have that shell so that we can interface with the outside world. Well, thank you, Shins. So Shin, have... just a quick, just a quick question, Shin. Uh, it, it is often asked of me, how will you differentiate an EPL pipeline with a data pipeline? Mm, ETL pipeline versus data pipeline. Okay. Uh, well, okay. ETL pipeline is effectively, you know, extract, transform, and transform and load. Yeah. Yeah. So data pipeline, right? It's you know, it it does involve a bit of you know, like it like extracting, transforming, and loading. Yeah. So I mean, it's quite similar. Mm -hmm. But when when I call when I mention data pipeline, I am actually referring to you know, like in general, it in mm -hmm. general, like it doesn't. So in general, right? What we have is we are taking in an input, and then we do something. So then do something can be, so that do something is, I mean, it, like if we saw it, say ETL, right, then it's a transform. So do something mm -hmm. is transform. And then do something, that transformation can be, uh, you know, a data manipulation. It can also be a machine learning pipeline, a machine learning okay. algorithm. So the, the reason why I say data pipeline instead of ETL pipeline is because I would like to generalize it to you know any data pipeline, it doesn't need to necessarily need to be a data engineering pipeline. Mm -hmm. So no, no specific, no specific. It's just like the data pipeline itself. And that is what we try. To, okay, because I, I've already, I always had that you know confusion with a lot of people when you try to explain data pipeline with them. They always, you know, oh, it, it, it's not what the data that you want to transform, right, or to, to, to transport. It is the pipeline so that you want to build. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you, too. We have one more minute. Right, Monsoor? Yes, yes, indeed. Oh, my God. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, Chins, uh, how do you turn from aerospace engineering to data engineering? What's motivates you? Like, I know that you're 90% self-taught and that's amazing and i really want to hear from you more can you, can you tell us more well oh, i am 90 percent self-taught because the 10 percent is from my from my formal education for my formal education because because in aerospace because in aerospace engineering when my like for my first degree we actually have a first year course called computing and that's where i learned c so that's actually where the 10 percent comes from the 10 percent can get smaller and smaller as i grow older but yeah, so I really, so when I so I already had some form of coding aptitude to begin with, and I did above average for that particular module, and 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 then I progressed to MATLAB, and then decided that hey I want to try some experimental work, but then the fundamentals have always been there, so when I decided to go back into computational aspect, I could pick up what where I left off. A little bit faster and i actually took a competitional specialization for my masters and that and all those coursework actually those coursework, all those experience with working with coding with parallels right with high performance computing systems all those actually helped lead me to where i am oh. yeah so i didn't start off with absolutely no background i actually started off with some background enough to be able to make them make the pivot Oh, that's amazing. Do you have any like source, study source or learning source to share to us on newbie or one or someone who want to like get a uh, first step in big data or data engineering stuff? Number one, learn Python. And I started out with the uh, Udacity intro to Python course. 
So the intro to Python course is what I started out with. And then after that, uh, I highly recommend the book called uh, the and yeah, I think it's I think it's a um I think it's the Python Data Science Handbook. So that is the book that I still refer to, and I highly recommend any aspiring data professional to actually give this book a look. Thank you, Shane. Oh, okay, refer to refer to their talk, your talk. Uh, can you give an example of side effect, and how can we manage the side effect? Yeah, side effect. Side effect. I think my I think my talk has a very already has an example, right? It's called okay. you know when I make when I make when I make a pizza when I try to toast a pizza, right? Yeah, I love it. I'm expecting I'm expecting nicely toasted pizza. I'm not expecting burnt pizza and you know or and and some burning fumes. So the burning fumes is a side effect that I don't want. Oh, yes. So any more? Uh, also, can we search for any more questions? Yes, go ahead, yes. Yeah. So anyone, does anyone want to shout to Shin more? Yeah? Unmute yourself if you want to talk. Can you really shy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, so I have one more question for you, Shin. <laughs> so what the most challenges you faced so far as a data, data engineer? Most challenging? Yeah. Oh, where maybe, should yeah. I start? Maybe in project area? Strangely, right. I mean, I mean, tech, I mean I, by right, it should be the technical challenges that technical challenges of like trying to design the like data pipelines that are reliable I mean that's supposed to be one of the big challenge but I find that actually like actually the biggest challenge is really communicating with your stakeholders and you know trying to get them to understand from your point of view and also trying to understand from their point of view because ultimately whatever uh, even with all the technical skills um Business people, I mean, ultimately, like, we are, we, are, we, are, we are paid, uh, paid to, you know, deliver something that brings value for the business. And, like, understanding the business aspect is actually, the, and, de and designing a solution that really meets their needs is actually probably the most challenging part because the other party may not be able to understand like how much you know and maybe the language may be different I mean, because our well, business language may be different then like when i talk about scalability it means something different to them for example and to that is and i think that is actually probably the most challenging part of being a data engineer because you may have the technical skills but if you can't communicate with the other party to deliver what they want and they are not happy with what you do, then that is going to be pretty disastrous as a data engineer. Thank you, Shin. So, Shin, can you tell us uh, where can we follow you or just like get in touch with you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think Fong will have a question, right? No, 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 I'll go ahead. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay, Shin, can you just like give us an Instagram or GitHub or something like that? Oh. I can if for those who are who don't mind a little um harsh truths or like um slightly less formal stuff, um I can be found on Twitter, on Chin Hui, so basically it's on Chin Hui. And for those who uh, who prefer something a bit more prim, proper, professional, uh, I can be found on LinkedIn also. Yeah, and otherwise, sometimes I may, sometimes occasionally I do write or write on my own personal website, which is onchinghui.me. So occasionally I do post articles there and I do update about my upcoming talks or events over there occasionally. Okay, thank you, Shane. I think that's it, right? Yeah, okay. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, you guys. You.